Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, well, uh, following the uh, morning session, I think uh, everyone's really interested about the uh, education issue, especially when, when Adam mentioned about this, uh, the pra practical uh, problems when you are conducting uh, indigenous um, uh, policies. Um, this afternoon's first session is very interesting because uh, uh, we have Professor Wu here. She is, uh, I would say, one of the earliest uh, uh, scholars who's actually dedicated her research on indigenous uh, studies. And she started uh, in, the, of course, it's in, no surprise because she's an anthropologist. And uh, um, her, I think her PhD is also in indigenous education. Indigenous. Oh, gender issues, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I saw some of her uh, past uh, um, publications, oh, sorry, uh, was on indigenous education, especially focused on uh, the higher education. Um, she's, she was the Dean of the College of Indigenous Studies at Donghua University and she's now the Professor uh, in the Department of Ethnic Relations and, and Cultures um, at the same university. Uh, today's uh, focus will be a slightly different from tomorrow's session. However, they are always uh, interlinked with each other. And today's uh, main focus is really placed on the dilemma and uh, 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 issue uh, challenges faced uh, indigenous uh, higher education. Without further ado, may I ask you to put your hands together and welcome Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, it's my great honor to be here. I would like to present my three years uh, research uh, result here. And it's uh, before the end of the due date, so your responses will be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, let me introduce my uh, the research right now. Uh, today the topic is uh, from with them to for us dynamic model in indigenous higher education. Uh, 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 I'm not an indigenous people, but I have worked on this issue about uh, 27 years. So uh, from the beginning, I always think I'm working with them. Uh, but right now, I think I'm working for us <laughs> because yes. we are together. So uh, for me, it's kind of dynamic model. So I try to put it into a, a research and become an action, try to influence the education in higher, uh, uh, in universities. Uh, right now, I'd like to uh, introduce, the, from the beginning, I'm asking the questions, who's knowledge? In higher education, usually we, uh, we are trained by Western uh, knowledge system, like myself, I graduated from Ohio State University, I learned anthropology from the Western point of view. <laughs> Even we have native anthropology uh, before I graduated, so I, I did my research about the gender issue in Taiwan, but uh, uh, basically, almost of all the uh, theories and uh, uh, appearance, uh, we always talking about the Western experience, uh, using Western point to explain what's happened in Taiwan, what's happened about the indigenous people. So <laughs> I think it's about the time we try to reflect the thinking and try to make some uh, movement. So uh, because I'm teaching anthropology, so I always find the textbook and teaching materials used in Taiwan still mainly reflections of dominant cultures point of view. Like right now, I use the uh, 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 codec uh, textbook is famous in Taiwan. Most of professors use this uh, as the introduction about uh, uh, cultural anthropology. It's a translation. <laughs> of course, most of the cases talking about uh, uh, my student will never know where it is. I have to explain using my own way. <laughs> so uh, I think it's about time. So I'm trying to do some Thing like culturally responsive teachings. Uh, I'm, I'm asking how do we bring world knowledge into our classroom? Uh, we, uh, I try to base on our teaching materials, on our own field work, local events, and current issues. Uh, and I'm asking uh, what would be students' responses. So in order to do this research, I already interviewed 10 professors in the university uh, about their experience. Basically, they all agree with me. Uh, uh, they need to add the uh, local materials. They need to uh, build up our own knowledge system so make can make students feel interesting. Otherwise, it's very, very far away <laughs> experience. And 
and uh, the student may not feel related to their uh, life. It's really the opposite of the way we, what we think anthropology should do. Okay, so I organized an uh, integrated project. I uh, tried to create uh, culturally safety cycles for indigenous students during the process of teaching courses. So I choose uh, four uh, core elements, uh, namely culture, language, art and communication. So I uh, recruit uh, four professors with me and try to write a project. Uh, fortunately, uh, four of us passed and one person didn't pass it. So we lack of some dimension for this research, but uh, anyway, we try very hard right now. Okay, it's a kind of uh, experiment with uh, teaching effectiveness in the context of indigenous cultural education. So we designed uh, indigenous culturally responsive teaching methods for all students. Because uh, my, our students, we have half of them are half from the uh, dominant uh, culture, Han people. Half of them are indigenous students. So uh, we have to uh, separate the different needs. Okay, this is uh, our original uh, way we think about uh, we are from different disciplines and we try to make connection. We try to use a lot of way, basically uh, course design and uh, combine uh, teaching activities. So we uh, have relation uh, from the beginning and try to make something happen. So uh, some uh, like uh, we have integrated curriculum. So I recruit uh, uh, the four professors together. We discuss uh, which class we, we are going to teach and which issue we can discuss together. And we can invite guest speakers. We can design the teaching activities. Both the, our students will be interested. So I designed a new method reflecting the holistic way of learning and teaching. Because for us, we think uh, teaching is not only one way we hold it become uh, uh, both and we have uh, uh, learning and teaching together. Usually my uh, professors refer to me, they also learn a lot from the indigenous students while we are teaching indigenous culture. This is also my experience because we know all the basic uh, idea concept but we don't know the details. So sometimes I teach it, the student give me the details. Even they don't know, they ask, they call their uh, grandma <laughs> and tell me later. <laughs> so I, I think I learned a lot after I, I teach uh, these kind of courses. Uh, we, we both uh, get a uh, uh, get, uh, uh, benefit from each other. So after the teaching and learning process, we engage in process of self-reflection and critical analysis of our, our effort. In the course of discussion between our team members, we usually meet uh, once uh, in a month and uh, we discuss what our uh, um, findings and uh, we uh, recruit uh, guest speakers, we design activities. So uh, for us, the discussion is also very important and we uh, try to modify what we are doing. So it's kind of, uh, we are, um, doing everything differently day by day because we accumulate a lot of experience right now. So we also evaluate the effectiveness of teaching from standpoint of students' feedback and their academic achievement. Because uh, I think it's not only for our uh, professors that what the student need and what the student want to learn and how do they see about uh, we put so uh, many uh, indigenous cultural materials into the uh, classroom what would our student think about uh, especially for Han students uh, because we have half of them how do they think about it uh, it's also our, our important issue to discuss and the whole process is kind of step by step so uh, it's a three years project, so we, we have a lot of time. Uh, to combine our class together, we're using indigenous culture as the overlapping core element. We design uh, teaching activities aimed at constructing and the reconstructing indigenous knowledge system. Because uh, we think uh, uh, indigenous uh, knowledge system usually they are separated by different disciplines when we teach it. Uh, culture, we're talking about culture, but maybe culture is related to political issues, maybe it's related to other issues. And also for the core um, elements about uh, indigenous knowledge, it's not divided into so many uh, segments. It's would be cool. Like I talk to the 
uh, elementary school teachers, when they teach the, the Rupu cultures, they explain gaga, gaya is kind of their core value. Uh, but if they put into uh, the, the teaching uh, uh, activities, they think it's uh, about moral education, but it's also spiritual education. It's uh, it's also uh, a religion, also kinship, also a subsistence. They're all related because they all follow that uh, Gaga spirit, so they can become the real Telugu people. So, uh, but uh, usually they, we have to satisfy what's going on for the classroom. So we only see a little bit, a part of them. It's not holy, holistic. Uh, system. So I think it's a, a big uh, issue. So I try to do things and I also discuss with uh, elementary school teachers. Okay, so I try it in my classroom. I uh, teach multicultural communication. So I invite uh, Dr. Chen from the art department to visit a junior high school attended by members of the two tribes with us and join our activities. Uh, basically, it's my uh, graduate uh, school uh, classes, so my students, they are PhD students or master's students. Uh, they are very happy to have the uh, experience, go there and talk to the uh, teachers over there. So the school's uh, principal arrange a discussion section with us, so we, c we could exchange ideas with teachers who are in charge of indigenous cultural education in this school, so basically. Uh, we this is the uh, the uh, uh, Mitos, uh, Mito High School. So this is their uh, through cultural classes. The actually the teacher they designed a new way to teach students about weaving. So this is um, Dr. Chen. This is my graduate student. This is their uh, students because they think it's easy to teach in a classroom uh, compared to the traditional way. So the teachers they work very hard, try to try to transmit cultures. They have a lot of creative ways to do it. I really envy them. Okay, uh, I we, we use participant observation. That's anthropology. We like to do it. So we engage in uh, their cultural education classroom, taking part in lesson activities centered around singing, weaving, and archery. We were asked by the teachers to provide some encouragement for the students. The students already perform well because they recognize the importance of traditional learning. I uh, remember when we went to the chorus, the, the students, they are singing because we uh, break into their classroom, they are waiting for us. And the teacher said, uh, please give us some encouragement. And Dr. Chen gave them the encouragement, how to be a real Telugu boy, so have very nice Telugu uh, girls, they give their uh, encouragement. And after we left, the teacher tell, tell us that uh, the students seem better. <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can do better after we left. So I think oh, we need to give them some encouragement. Uh, it's important. Otherwise, they may think they just perform it for entertaining, uh, entertaining people. But we told them the real reason why you are learning your traditional singing or dance. Uh, it's the important for the formulation of your personality, something like that. So we were all impressed by the effort of the teachers and the students. And also the teachers, they are happy because they have so many questions to ask us. <laughs> they think it's the right way, how should you do it? And they need to uh, know a lot of outside resources. So we provide them, they can uh, join some competition. They definitely will win because I think they work very hard and have very good results. So uh, for both of us, it's positive. My uh, student evaluated because after that I evaluated this and they say this visit is a positive because it enabled them to see what goes on uh, in the real school because we always talk about just from the papers. <laughs> uh, right now they can really see the professors and uh, teachers and give them opportunity to ask questions and inspire each other. This is uh, the principal and uh, this my students and my group members. They even give us uh, this welcome. <laughs> so we feel very happy. This. Okay, so we have challenges. During the, their teaching and the learning process, we can understand 
how the teacher uh, design the courses and what challenge they are facing. Because most of the elementary school or middle or high school stu uh, 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 teachers, they are not indigenous people. Even they are indigenous people, they don't really know their cultures very well uh, because they are educated by the dominant cultural system, uh, uh, educational system. So uh, they are facing this uh, job. They have to teach indigenous culture. But what is what in this culture is they usually learn from the internet or the, 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 they learn from uh, the professor's uh, uh, writings, but they don't really understand it, it. So they write down something, but some of them are really funny, so I tell them, don't do that. <laughs> they can try the other way, because they, they try to over uh, exaggerate. Uh, it's good, it's good, but uh, we cannot always say, oh, everything is good. We must find the reality. We have to teach the students what's going on. So uh, I think we need to give the teachers uh, help. So that I try to tell them uh, they need uh, uh, some uh, evaluation after they finish the research. Or they need some practice and we can help them as a, a, a university professors. So right now I have some cooperation with them. Even under uh, limited resources in the formal education system, the tribal people show their patients to teach, teach their own culture in the school. Uh, because even the resources is not uh, enough, but uh, uh, they really worry about the younger people cannot sing the old song anymore, they cannot uh, go to hunting anymore, so they, uh, even we give them very few, few money, but they still very happy to do that. And uh, I find out uh, uh, the indigenous teachers, they uh, get more responsibility to do it. So right now they are doing very well as a leader to uh, do the uh, similar uh, uh, activities. The other uh, class is my cultural anthropology classes. I invite Dr. Tang, uh, she's a Daruku uh, uh, linguistics uh, from the Department of Ethnic Languages and Communication to join our teaching activities. Uh, her students got a chance to teach my students about the indigenous language. So it was amazing to watch students with various backgrounds sitting around each table learning different ethnic groups in my classroom. I think, oh, that's my dream as an anthropologist. <laughs> the linguistic students try their utmost to teach my students efficiently, and their passion was uh, contentious. In the process, we knew we were creating new and student-friendly environment for learning about English culture together. So this semester, I designed another course on keep on doing that. Uh, also, we uh, have some guest speaker. This is uh, Pauline Ching from University of Hawaii. Uh, she gave us uh, her experience and the student uh, learned a lot about Hawaii indigenous education. It's widened my students' experience. Uh, they know what's going on in, the, in the Hawaii. They get inspired from the successful story. Also, uh, Dr. Ching is very uh, helpful. <coughs> My student just go into her hotel room and she gave them a two hours uh, talk about their own uh, questions. They usually don't ask us because they think they find someone can really talk. So I, I think Dr. Chin did a very good job. Okay, and she used uh, Hawaii young people's experience to inspire my student because she think uh, young people can do uh, cultural heritage records. Uh, our people can do the same thing. So this is Dr. Tang, she's translating. This is uh, my dean. <laughs> this is me. My dean is also attend. She's a Zhou, uh, uh, Zhou tribe people. I also invite uh, a Japanese scholar from the Jiu uh, University talking about uh, international understanding uh, education. And uh, I think my students are very grateful because they ask him about the question. Christians, uh, they will be have Olympic and, uh, uh, in Tokyo, and they have prepared a lot of things to help foreigners to adapt uh, Japanese culture. But my students ask them how uh, they think that foreigners they need to learn about Japanese culture, not only Japanese who try to learn foreign cultures or all the activity design. So I think my students really really know the cultural uh, equality. <laughs> okay, this is her speech, my professors, and uh, uh, they are asking the questions. Okay, the other classes is uh, indigenous education class. 
I invited a Canadian scholar to compare the differences and similarities between two cultures. Uh, 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 Dr. Simon, uh, he insists we are circling each other, uh, so we can describe, I think he, he came here, <laughs> uh, to describe the feelings about the feather in class. So they think we are equal, so the uh, professors and teachers should be in the cycle, everybody are equal. They, he created the environment. So I, I think it's nice. So after he left, I do the same thing in my classroom, so I learned a lot. And uh, also there's another uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Su, uh, Shu Meiyang, uh, principal. Uh, she, uh, she is a Bunong uh, uh, principal. Uh, her PhD dissertation is about uh, how to become a Bunong adult because she used her own experience, she did her own field work, and she designed very good uh, uh, course design for the elementary school. So uh, her book is very popular right now. I, I invite her to come and it's very useful. Because sometimes I told students so and so, and they think oh, it's theoretically, but we find somebody they they really did it, and uh, they have very good results. It's uh, very inspiring. Okay, I also invite our PhD student Sifu. She's a uh, uh, he is a uh, uh, army uh, uh, student. Uh, Actually, he has a lot of experience. He introduced uh, silent teaching to make practice and discussion together with Dr. Tang's class about tribal language teachings. This is our, our picture, this is Dr. Simon, and our student, because they are, we are transmitted further, so th th you, you have to talk about your experience. So my student, they are uh, thinking and uh, other professor, he is coming soon. <laughs> okay, they all coming too. I, I think he uh, he's very successful for the speech. Yeah, Daniel as well. Uh, the one next. Ah, uh, Daniel Lin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in my group right now this year. Okay. Ah, uh, Doctor uh, Shu Mei Liang. Yeah, he 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 says uh, from the difference he fa she find uh, the value of her culture and help her to become a, a PhD and of course uh, she know the value of her own culture so she try to introduce to my student it's also very inspiring I think it is better than what I'm talking just invite some people come <laughs> they, they can say <laughs> my student they are very. Uh, happy and then we have uh, this is an, another speech okay and uh, that this is the first speech uh, she, he introduced uh, the silent teaching and we make students into different you saw the students we have various uh, cultural backgrounds so they sit in, around the circle learning the language together uh, not only indigenous language but also uh, Taiwanese and Hakka so, so, so they, they, they we a circle with and learning different languages in this place. I always think it's, it's nice. <laughs> See, they are very happy. <laughs> yeah, they, then this is a tribal language uh, teacher. So she asks us a lot of things. You see, this is our tribal uh, language teacher. They are working very hard and they discuss with young people, Han people and non Han uh, and indigenous people together. Uh, in our this environment, we call it Daruan. That's a, a meaning of meeting place for Amis people. So I, I think it's better than the regular class classroom. Okay, then I bring student into the tribe. So I use my part high cultural communication and art classes, uh, uh, go to the Amis tribe museum. So there are the chief, uh, uh, raw, raw chief, uh, Dr. Chen Li, and museum staff, research assistant, Xie, and uh, my students. We are uh, asked them to introduce the tribe. And we have some discussion. This the chief, he is very happy. And this is Amis, uh, my uh, graduate students. And uh, when we discuss together, and uh, the chief, uh, he said, he feel very sad because young people don't learn their own language anymore. So uh, and, uh, he replied in, uh, in Amis language oh. fluently, so make him very happy. Oh. <laughs> so from the beginning, I think he only sit here and maybe he not, not interesting about our group discussion, but he's happy all the time. <laughs> so I just sit back and see what's going on. 
the, the student, even they call out to other graduate students, and we discuss the same uh, issues, like uh, do we need to create a safe uh, cycle for the indigenous students, students in campus? Uh, we have a lot of discussions. It's interesting. Also, my another uh, class research method, I just uh, asked my assistant making film, you will see later. It's not very well because we are not professional, we just record, but uh, I still use it as a teaching material. And I showed that to the chief before he came. So I, uh, he, I get his proof. And when he came to the class and he, uh, because he know what's going on, he is the actor, <laughs> many actor for that film. So he's very happy. She stopped us all, all the time when he wants to say something. So I think he's happy <laughs> about, uh, I'm introduced his culture in my classroom. And uh, uh, he tried to explain us the old, old detail about uh, uh, Harvest Festival. And students ask their question. I and Chief try to answer about the research skill and culture content. And uh, I think uh, the dialect is very interesting because my student asked the chief the question like, uh, how can you tell us uh, uh, you distinguish the food you can eat or you cannot eat? But the chief cannot answer this question because <laughs> it's not different. Uh, it's not the same logic. But he is very smart. He said, just wait a minute. I have a lot of vegetable and food in his trunk. So he wait 10 minutes, he go back and bring all the things and explain to students. We can eat this, we can use that. So uh, he showed us some food I don't even know <laughs> because I never use it. So I think I learned a lot too. So we can see the different way, uh, but uh, we still need to learn uh, from each other. So that's why I teach my students. Don't ask the people directly your question because they cannot answer. <laughs> you have to answer it after you have done enough field work. Okay, this is, I'm showing the film we have discussed. Okay, uh, after the uh, class, I have the modified survey. I cho chose 11 questions which are related to my teaching goals from McKinley's uh, questionnaire. And uh, I don't really like uh, uh, quantitative data, so I added five open-end questions to elicit answers from students in their own world. And then I evaluate students' feedback about invited lectures and teaching activities uh, in these two years. This basic is the uh, result. It's everything is up uh, between uh, three point five or something like that. Very good result. Uh, this is the questionnaire. Uh, I don't think I need to read it. <laughs> or you don't want to read it? <laughs> anyway, they they think uh, uh, it's successful, so the score is high. And a high level of satisfaction with teaching activities, including invited speakers. Everything. Mm -hmm. The open question, I think, is more interesting here. What did you learn? Which parts were your, were your most impressive? How could the teaching activities improve? Will this topic be useful for you? What would you like to see in terms of future class arrangement? And this is, I just uh, uh, conclude some uh, results, not everything, but part of it. Mm, the first one is they appreciate the importance of tribal elders as the bearers of traditional wisdom, which is in danger of disappearing as they gradually die off. They really feel it because I bring them into the classroom. To apply the cultural knowledge they glean from class in their daily lives, to in interpret the meanings of culture, they have learned various ways to present and observe cultures from the guest speakers. Not only expressing eagerness to join the process of cultural design, but they also appreciation for the chance to learn new things from guest speakers. Also, we can learn from each other. I emphasize the dynamic part. The students' uh, answers explain the importance of learning from each other. They spoke to the importance of professors being willing to listen to current interests and needs of the students. We are not just teaching, we will watch their feedback and uh, uh, fix it later. Creating more opportunity for two-way interactions between students and professors. We all look forward to arranging more significant teaching activities for the class. And uh, then I have the team. I go to the elementary school to give them some cultural consultant uh, 
we exchange experience about how to make indigenous cultural teaching materials. We are advising the effective way to show the cultural traits for this Daluku school. Because uh, Dr. Tang is a Daluku, uh, local people, so when she shows up, it's very impressive and uh, persuasive. So I think uh, we, I just sit back <laughs> and see what's going on. And we have more interaction and cooperations between this school and the tribe. This is their school. You see the Great Mountain, and this is a rainbow. They have a myth about the uh, legend about the uh, rainbow. This Dr. Tang is David. It's me. I sit back happily. Wow. <laughs> she has to tell people the importance of keeping their language because they are dying from that. She feels very responsible. And we talk about the dogs are uh, their teachers. So we give, they have. They ask us a lot of questions. Okay, then we, uh, this semester I bring the uh, more students, uh, not most, more professors. This is Yang Jun Kai, uh, also from Daniel's uh, uh, department. Uh, because he make the film, so I invite him to join my group next year. Uh, we just sit back and watch the teachers teaching the students about uh, uh, Telugu cultures. And this, she's also our graduate student. She graduated and she's writing. She finished her thesis about her, the, this school, how they teach uh, cultural issues. Okay, this is Dr. Chen. Uh, this, yeah, a lot of, they have this like art or something. And we have different issues. Then we discuss each other. And they ask us questions. Uh, and they, uh, my students created a new way to do exercise. They are using their traditional movement. So it's interesting. This like uh, they are doing some like something, play the uh, music instrument, and uh, the students feel very interesting. So we should okay. This is the principal. This is uh, the director. He invited us, and he hope we can come to their classroom. Then uh, more, <laughs> maybe next time to do it again. Uh, I invited, this time we have uh, Dr. Yang, and this is Dr. Liu from the Education College, and she is very enthusiastic right now. We, we are trying to uh, do a new project. <laughs> okay, this is the, uh, their campus. And also we do something, I think it's important, we presenting in the tribe. And uh, the, the, the uh, chief, they doing the ceremony, to their ancestors before our presentations. Even the group people are not so many, but uh, I think they are all uh, very interesting in our issues. So we presenting our research funding in front of the tribal peoples, try to listen to their reaction and give us some feedback. I really did learn a lot, like how to pronounce the language right uh, perfect, uh, perfectly, <laughs> because usually we don't put the right way pronounce it, they, uh, how to translate, it. and they say, oh, this is not good translation, we use another translation. And who is the people in the picture? Usually, after we take picture, we don't know, but they will tell us because it's their neighbors. Okay, so we show in film, uh, taking in the chat. Uh, 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 in the end, I share my research material and publish paper with the tribe that I gave them all of our uh, taking film and pictures. This is our did some ceremony, this is a wine. Okay, um, Dr. Tang, Dr. Chen, Daniel, my student show, uh, no, assistant show in the film. Okay, this is, he put all the pictures, <laughs> give to him, and he's very happy, and then he is going to put it in the museum so everybody can copy. I think I should do it. Okay, findings, I, I think we can enrich and empower. The teachings of these indigenous cultures can, in turn, enrich the current teachings for all students and empower indigenous students in higher education settings. Also, we have some cooperation with our state campus. This is from Ciji, uh, uh, Ji Da Xue. And I, I visit her and talk to her. We hope we can have each other. This is Awi's director. <laughs> we asked him to come uh, with our team uh, about uh, his experience running a uh, class uh, uh, in Donghua. And he, he also interested in what we are doing in our college. So uh, we all have a very good discussion for our research. And also we attend in the tribal activities. Uh, this is uh, the bird hunting. This is me. This is my student. This is the elder people. This is the dog. <laughs> 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 they share the food. 
That's important because they hunt the bird, and then they they share food each other, uh, each group. Uh, they are uh, relatives or good friends, and uh, they are very friendly because I don't know anybody of them, but I eat a lot of good food. <laughs> 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 then I present that in 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 enterprise, uh, anywhere, any anywhere meeting. <laughs> Daniel is also there. All, four of us uh, presenting this. Okay. <laughs> and also, I made some teaching materials from the field. I have some self mail uh, uh, teaching materials. I did field work. I connect with the tribes. I understand indigenous culture better. And I accumulated and improved in my knowledge. So, this is the PowerPoint. I don't think it can show up here. Anyway, I have a lot of things to discuss. Uh, we have picture of film. I use this uh, teaching in my classroom. Okay, my conclusion, culture is dynamic and sustaining, learning is additive, whole and enriching strength. Education is uh, centrally above love. The dialogue interweaving uh, of research theory and practice is necessary in a changing world. I learned this from Paris and Ellen in 2017. And uh, uh, we find it's possible to find a model of integration which is not limited by current course classifications. So I try to move moving beyond culturally responsive, culturally responsive teachings. We also need to emphasize and be aware of the subjectivity of indigenous people and the power of the culture. And I use uh, McCarthy and Lee in uh, 2014, uh, culture sustaining revitalizing uh, pedagogy. And uh, they think we should uh, try to erase the uh, colonial influence because it's a really crucial uh, component of language and cultural uh, recognition. And uh, we need to do the uh, community basis education accountabilities. And we need to root it in indigenous education uh, sovereignty. So according to per, uh, Paris and Aline, pushing uh, its theoretical boundary, growing its practice through case study and uh, critique, we need bring theory and practice together to offer a way forward, uh, reaching our goal of developing a more pluralistic and just uh, future. So they call in for sustaining and revitalizing that which has over the centuries sustained us as communities of color struggling to make it. I use their idea uh, to uh, explain what we are doing because uh, they uh, emphasize the importance of uh, four R, uh, respect, responsibility, relationship, responsibility. <coughs> and now we add on a reflective because we need to always think and criticize ourselves with the tribe. And uh, we always feel humble. We need to respect the elder people. Just like I interviewed the elder people, they say, oh, Professor, I know nothing. I, I don't graduate from the school uh, because we are poor or something. Like, oh, you know everything. We don't know even, don't even know that. It, uh, they say, how do I can do for you? Sing the song <laughs> from the beginning. And then they, you see what they are showing in their uh, ceremony. They are really actor or actress in that uh, occasion. So we know nothing about their culture. Okay, so I try to adopt in a for us model, which in turn shifted away from the Western approach, just like what I say from the beginning, I really think it's for us. Everything I get benefit, they also get benefit. We learn from each other. We enrich our uh, multicultural uh, in Taiwan. Teachers and students from a uh, divergent cultural background and disciplines can all work together to unpack the holistic knowledge system of indigenous culture. Okay, so from the beginning, we are separate to try to make some connection. Right now, you see from my uh, materials, we uh, finally find some uh, similarities, and we can work on and try to make it bigger. <laughs> and we can show indigenous uh, cultural system in higher education, and we are trying to uh, form a cultural sustaining system in this uh, safety circles uh, on campus and try to um, make uh, 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 the tribes can be forever uh, in higher education. That's all for today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, in, in, the, in the lecture you mentioned several times, it's quite interesting, but at the same time quite striking, you said uh, the student 
don't believe me. They believe the speaker because they are either uh, Turuku or the Amis. They are from they are real, mm -hmm. real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. So this is quite an interesting, and I suspect it's a challenging position to have as a Han scholar and mm -hmm. academic to teach and engage and and uh, uh, and learn from the indigenous uh, uh, communities. So could you let us know, coming from a Han perspective and trying to, for, from the perspective for us, that's a brilliant uh, title, and I wonder what's your, you know, experience and your take on this, you know, after 20 years, pretty uh, amazing. <laughs> Another question is, um, there are quite a lot of things, actually Adam mentioned this morning, about the uh, teachers' training. So you are actually talking about mm -hmm. training teachers who really understand, or at least coming from that sort of background, understand their own, mm -hmm. or understand other people's culture and languages. So what's the most important thing you think need to be done? Because you are now involved in this uh, education, indigenous education committee, I think, mm -hmm. for the um, MOEs. Thing. Am I right? Mm, okay. Actually, I'm the MOE's uh, indigenous uh, political uh, education policy member <laughs> right okay. now. And I have served for this position at least 10 years before, uh, in the very beginning, this, we call it the San Bao Jiao Yu where I was a member over there. <laughs> <laughs> then sometimes I am not invited, but when this year I come back. So I think I, I've been there at least 15 years. So I saw a lot of changes. And I, I think your, in, your question is very, very important because as a non-indigenous scholar, I always be asked why you are interested in these issues, or which, which, what's your ethnic background, why you are doing this, and uh, I, and some of the um, uh, Han scholar they just try to pretend they are uh, part of uh, indigenous people, so they maybe. Uh, 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 adopted <laughs> by the uh, by the tribal people, and that's anthropology. We usually do the way, but I didn't do that because I <laughs> I just think uh, since I'm not in these people, I don't need to try to pretend that I I was that. And I find my I find out my position as a uh, 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 non-indigenous scholars. I can do a lot of things for not only for indigenous people but also for uh, dom dominant cultures people, only Han people, because uh, they. They really don't understand indigenous culture, so they have a, a lot of uh, uh, mistakes, so I have to educate them. But I cannot say educate because they maybe not accept it. Just, that, just what I say if I tell students, oh, the army school, army culture is nice or something, they maybe think they should answer the question for my exam, maybe they get good score, but they don't really believe it. That's why I invite the real person. We go to the real class and tell. They show show the evidence. The indigenous people can do this. They are smart. They are intelligent. <laughs> Their knowledge is is really amazing. So I learn a lot from them. They can teach me a lot of things. But in the beginning, it's really a challenge because they they some more of them they think. They don't really know why they can go to the college classroom, uh, and usually, for the first time, why the indigenous uh, uh, elder people to my class, they reject it. They feel scared. So that's why I need to show the film first and encourage them, and I really bring in uh, the the chief to my class, and uh, he really enjoy the process. So, uh, it. That's why I say we should do it step by step. It takes time, but uh, uh, we see the good result right now. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the first question. The second question is for teacher's education, because I was the, the a professor from the Hualien Teacher's College. At that time, I tried to open some courses like indigenous culture, indigenous education, but nobody take my courses because it's not required courses, and they are uh, very uh, busy uh, 
uh, for their own like discipline training, they have to pass some exams so they can get their license. Something that uh, that's why I, I ate some uh, teaching materials in the uh, like uh, social science research method <laughs> or uh, a cultural anthropology. I, I also taught over there because they need this class. And uh, I remember the first time I showed the film uh, showing the indigenous culture. I asked the student give me feedback. One of the uh, senior students just write down, ah, oh, right now I know indigenous people, they do really have culture. I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> they are going to become the teachers for the indigenous students. And most of the our students, they will become the teachers in the uh, remote area, especially for indigenous uh, uh, elementary school at that time. I remember one student come back and tell us, once she found out she has to teach in the elementary school, in, in the tribe, she had bad dream. She said some people use a knife try to <laughs> catch her <laughs> because they know nothing. They don't get any chance to learn indigenous culture, to know indigenous people. Even we still have indigenous students, few, like three or four in the class because they are, uh, they are they have to come back to their own tribe become a teacher. So we have that. But they are not uh, their culture are not emphasized, they don't really get chance. Also the teachers over there they don't really know very well. So <laughs> that's why I uh, I, I think uh, as I, I used to be the director for the Center of Indigenous Education <laughs> 25 years ago. And I think it's not enough. So I uh, moved to uh, Donghua after uh, it is founded and I try to set up Indigenous College because I think we need to have the long-term planning and get the support systematically so we can finish something, not just because of the government, they have budget, so we have more money this year, maybe next year, no, no, and we change it by party so we don't get fun. <laughs> I cannot do things that, that uh, I cannot do indigenous culture that that. So I need uh, formal colleges. That's why we set up the, the culture over there. I mean, uh, right now it's almost 20, 22 or two years. So uh, we so uh, we sh uh, we have seen a lot of uh, changes and it's good. So uh, do I answer your question? <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, in the early part, uh, earlier part of your talk, um, you, you referred to, I've, I've forgotten the name, it might have been Sufu. Ah, uh, Sufu. Um, Sufu's uh, silent learning. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by silent learning? It sounds oh. a very interesting concept. Okay, and um, it's a uh, um, Maori people. They teach how to uh, speak Maori languages. They uh, in use, silence. <laughs> yeah, they have some. Uh, you see, the, from the pictures, they have some tools. So uh, they have to. Uh, silence didn't mean they don't talk. That means they don't really use traditional way to talk, they just uh, use the tools. So we, we say something like, if this is pen, they maybe say something like this, and then, then <laughs> transmit to different people, and they learn from each other. Some people forget the pronunciation, they will teach them. And uh, they emphasize the spirit of sharing and teaching, and uh, respect people, re repeat, and uh, it's a kind of cooperative uh, uh, sharing learning environment. So it's a, it seems to me to be a little bit like uh, what, what is known as re using realia in, in more conventional language uh, uh -huh. teaching. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Realia is when in, instead of um, just uh, having um, uh, dialogue, uh, you, you, for example, if you were selling something, you would have the bottle and heavy <laughs> water and you know, so only I up us. Very water. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah, some, something like that. It's different from our traditional way to learn a new language because usually you just repeat again, repeat again, but this time they form a group so they learn from each other. So they find out the logics by the uh, teaching. They don't explain the grammar in, the, in advance. They just say, oh, then you can see from the activities you find out your own logics. Then you know how to speak their languages. 
I, I don't really know. I just remind people to teach, I, but I learned uh, from, uh, what they are teaching. So I think it's interesting. Uh, my students always uh, feel it's interesting because they like to, to do things, learning by doing, not just uh, one way, one way teaching. The, the traditional way I'm teaching is like one way. The students usually don't ask me questions. <laughs> not like here. <laughs> yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not close. It's okay. Sure. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah. Oh, so it just strikes me that's how a mother and father teach children, huh? Oh, okay. Mother to child. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is, am I understanding correctly? Is, is it similar to how it's a natural way of learning, no? It's, it's more natural. Actually, I'm not an expert. <laughs> so I just uh, uh, invite speakers to come and uh, Dr. Tang. She's a linguistic design person. So I don't really know so the, 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 more, everything. We're talking the silent learning. Uh -huh, yeah, so I don't really know silent teaching very well. Is it similar to mother to child? When uh, it's kind know? of different because uh, they uh, don't give the answer immediately. The, the, the students have to find out later. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I want to ask um, whether um, they have the, like a traditional sports that play an important role in the culture, and whether music also has a um, important place in the culture and a role that it plays. Yeah, uh, the sport uh, because maybe in their culture they don't think it's a sport. <laughs> they just combine everything together, just like we saw they run, but it's for their ceremony. They have some meaning, they, like uh, the age uh, transmission, they, uh, the formal age group. Uh, so they all process. That's why I think it's a holistic thing. They, we don't classify it like sports, music, and dance, because the dance and the singing, they are together. <laughs> they don't separate. But if we have to teach in our classroom, oh, this is indigenous music, indigenous dance, why they are separated? <laughs> also, usually we, we do that things after the dinner or after the, or during the parties. Just like the uh, the uh, Ling Hongzi, the army's elder people, he try to classify their uh, songs using different way because they don't think the our way is fit for their situations. Mm. Great. Is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And David wants to ask the next question. Uh, don't uh, don't panic. Oh. Hold on. Hold your horses. <laughs> so at the, at the start of an academic year, I'm always curious about. Uh, why students take our classes. Uh -huh. So uh, one of the things um, uh, you mentioned, and also Joyce mentioned this uh, uh, two weeks ago, was that uh -huh. something like half the students on the class are Han and then half are Indigenous. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about whether the, um, the reasons that these students are taking the class are, are, are different. I mean, in other words, um, uh, why are these uh, are Han students taking the class? What's their kind of their motivation? Yeah, uh, because my courses so there are two kind. One is required courses, so they have to be there. Ah, <laughs> half of them Han, yeah. half of them indigenous people. But I have the uh, the other courses they choose free. So uh, usually, I as to my uh, observation, this is not really half half, but uh, maybe. Uh, Maybe uh, indigenous people is um, more than Han people, and uh, I think one Han people did challenge me. He he, he said, "I'm a Han people. Why should I learn indigenous education? It's not related to me." And and but he still in my class, and I say, "Why you are here? You are a good teacher." I think. I <laughs> oh my goodness! But I then I told him. The indigenous education, they cannot finish only by indigenous people. Exactly. They need us. That's why I'm still here. I'm not a, a destroyer. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, I'm, we are important because we need to tell a lot of Han people why the indigenous culture, they are important, what we can learn from them. Because if we only indigenous people tell us their culture is nice, maybe it's not so perspective. But I am teaching Han people. <laughs> it's persuasive. Usually, I, as a professor, I told the tribal people, your culture is variable. It's also persuasive. 
because they lose their confidence. Just like I said, I interviewed a 90 years old lady. She told me from the beginning, Sensei, I don't mean, he, he, she said she didn't understand anything. She did, but I said, you know everything. I'm the one, I don't know, I don't understand everything. And the head, uh, the chief, he went to my classes. She, Explain to my student twice. I only graduated from uh, elementary school. I don't get good education. So, but because my family is poor, and I have to encourage him in front of all my students. Oh, you are really smart. I will, will you really like to learn a lot from you about uh, army uh, cultures. And he's also he's a chief. He knows everything. How to run group have so big festival and cooperate people together. It's smart. It's intelligent. Why he said he knows nothing because he didn't graduate from university. I think this idea is very important because when I will have a uh, uh, paper present in mainland China, I told people about it. I invited indigenous people to my classroom. I remember one uh, Chinese minority PhD student just come after the, my presentation and bring my bag for me and say, oh, I already uh, chose uh, who uh, my relative who will be in my class. I think they will be very happy. Oh, at, at that time, so happy because, oh, they can do the same thing. Yeah, because they can teach in the universities definitely, definitely different meaning for the tribal people. That means they get rec uh, recognition by us. Yeah, the, right now it's the, they are only uh, my guest speakers, but I, I'm trying to um, make them become the really formal teachers, like uh, tribal language teachers. Uh, when I was uh, uh, dean at that time, I tried to hire tribal language teachers to my university. Most of the uh, teaching evaluation members say they don't even graduate from the high school. How can we, as a university preacher, how can you how can you hire them? So, oh, Oh, they know a lot of things we didn't really know. You know, I have to persuade them because they are teaching something. Nobody can do that. And in the beginning, they say they need a real professor to cooperate with them so they can teach their own language. But right now, we don't have that situation. So things are changing. Yeah, but we need to get improvement. We can put more effort. Patty, aren't you taking, asking questions? Maybe. Yeah. No, no, I was just waving at Jules. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Oh, okay. More questions? Yes, Adam. Thank you. Hi. Thanks very much for the talk. Uh, your classroom seemed very exciting. You know, um, oh. <laughs> the students seem very enthusiastic. You know, um, and engaged. So I have two questions for you, but I'll just ask one. Mm -hmm. First, um, you can ask too. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so, it sounds to me like the basic premise is that Taiwanese indigenous cultures are either ignored or deprecated by the majority Han population. And therefore, the goal in your classrooms is to essentially um, point out that these knowledge systems have value, that these people have value and to learn from those, the holistic knowledge system of indigenous cultures. Right. Mm. I get that. Um, what it makes me wonder about is, is, I guess the premise seems to be like, there's this thing out there, and we're going to bring this thing into the classroom, as opposed to question that thing, and think critically about that thing, and that holistic knowledge system, for example, right? It's undergone many, many changes over the years that I'm not, I'm not so sure it exists. Um, indigenous cultures, like any cultures, have things historically and now that many of us would find problematic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could be gender issues, could be mm -hmm. certain cultural practices, historically or now, whatever. Um, and I understand why it's necessary to say, we want to learn from you, we want to learn these things, but I'm wondering about the role of, 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 of critical thinking in that, about what's going on. For example, if you have a speaker come in and teaching about the language of a particular group, 
but not talking about the fact that, say, a majority of the people who identify as that group don't speak that language. How do they perceive their ethnic identity, right? How, what are the problems inherent in that? How can we talk about that? Then um, it, it, it seems... It seems like there are questions that should be asked, you know? And I understand why someone wouldn't ask critical questions, because one wouldn't want to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I don't respect X, therefore I'm not going to say anything negative about X, or point out that what X is about may not be 100% great, you know, or 100% um, consistent internally. But I, I wonder if the sort of overall cause is advanced by just saying, oh, sort of bowing down, you know what I mean, to, to, to what other people have to say about themselves. Does that, does that make any sense? Mm, I don't really understand the last part. What it means to be indigenous mm -hmm. is a very difficult question. It's very complicated. Different people can have different responses. There are a lot of tensions in that question and in that answer, however you deal with it, right? But it sounds like the model of indigenous education that you're talking about is where somebody comes and says, this is mm -hmm. what it is. And the point is for the students to respect that and understand that. Um, but that I'm wondering if that's a faithful representation of Reality. Does that make sense? Reality. That means uh, what's your real reality? <laughs> if I may. Yes. <laughs> you, you I know wonder. What I'm saying. I wonder whether um, Adam. I don't know whether it's true or not. Whether your question is really to 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 raise an issue that uh, and ask. Apart from these really idealistic and uh, seemingly really nice idea about holistic knowledge about indigenous culture and people and the past, um, really should there be some sort of critical element also brought into this kind of education to make it as a more whole and more honest way of thinking mm -hmm. about? Yeah. And because I always teach students about cultural relatives and so uh, we don't really think, uh, just like I say, we cannot over exactly the beauty of indigenous culture because it's maybe not the truth, the reality. But the important thing is we, we should know what indigenous culture is. So we are not trying to simplify it or we are not trying to make it uh, uh, over the, I um, mean, uh, think it's too too, too nice and uh, put everything in anthropology with so it but uh, savage mind mm -hmm. no more savage yeah but I think it's uh, out of date right now to uh, use that way because just mm -hmm. what you saw uh, this morning uh, Dr. Awi I think uh, uh, he's a very good ev evidence show the indigenous people can be so nice <laughs> so brilliant <laughs> so they can um, um, understand traditional and their uh, what we call modern uh, the, uh, knowledge system, they can integrate it uh, together and uh, he can do things well. I, I mean, we need a lot of successful model to show it, so that's why I always bring people, I, I just, just don't uh, say my conclusion immediately because it's not so persuasive, we need evidence. And uh, I find out from my own students, especially indigenous students, when they come into my college, actually their academic level is not really uh, very uh, high because they kind of uh, we have uh, half the uh, protected so they can uh, come to from the uh, not from the regular entrance exam so they are the coming we use another way to evaluate in the beginning uh, like their English is not very well they cannot write Chinese very well something like that but after four years when they graduate to the, uh, with my uh, Han students together, I think they are not really uh, so big uh, gap uh, between them because uh, 
we give them chance to learn, give them confidence to learn, they will find their own way. And they can become better than I think. That's why I like education. Because a lot of things are not made by me, I just stimulate, uh, inspire them, and uh, they become good things. Of course, you say, we, we have some negative things, like uh, in the beginning we have some conflict. I remember in the first year, uh, our college started, and some Han people just uh, <laughs> knock my door and say, why the teachers teach the negative things about uh, Han people in the classroom? And uh, they try to <laughs> protest. <laughs> I just say, if that's true, why should we should not learn? We should we should know how to face it and how to how to negotiate and try to solve the problem. Just not not eat, just uh, not mention it is not right. So I I told her this morning. I said, you you we are envy you because you already get the experience to be uh, <laughs> to be sterile <laughs> sterile. Uh, you don't even need to go abroad to have that negative experience. It's a minority. Yeah, and 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 right now my students after graduate they come back to tell us they say they learn a lot about uh, uh, intercultural communication since they have the chance meet Han people in in the college so um, that's why I, I I try to teach more about intercultural. Communication. I think that's not our next step. But move beyond uh, only talk about indigenous culture. We need to apply to the intercultural communication. Even I can talk about the national politics using that uh, cultural sensitivities to uh, to help my students to face the changing world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, if anyone else has a question, can... yes, Daryl first. I, I then first. I had I had on that. On uh, that. Okay. Okay. So sure. Um, I, I think that that previous question misses uh, a crucial element of the study of indigenous peoples and minority peoples in general, and that is that the entrance point of indigenous peoples into a dominant culture is itself the issue. They're not symmetrically placed. They're not equal as per the dominant culture. And it is it undoubtedly the case that within indigenous communities, there's all sorts of inegalitarian practices that require questioning. The issue isn't whether they should be questioned. The issue is whether the first instance of our entry into their lives is that we dismiss their practices, because their practices are many and multifold but they haven't had any participation within wider society, and they are fundamentally unequal. So, you know, we wouldn't come into the Second World War and start questioning our practices towards homosexuality in England. We'd be, first of all, concerned about, you know, winning the war. And the same thing applies in minority publics. You don't enter into them when they've been asymmetrically placed and first of all go into all of the terrible things that they've been doing. Thank you. But I, I, I presume that Adam didn't really deny that. Sure, no, no, no. I, yeah, no. You came across that way. <laughs> uh, no, no, well then that's a misinterpretation, but I apologize for not articulating better. Um, it seems to me that... Um, having one static image in your mind of a culture that's negative and replacing with another static image in your mind that's positive is not necessarily an advance. And um, not to mention and Taiwan has passed the very entrance, uh, entrance point. And can, okay, let's just, stop this. Let's go for Daryl <laughs> and go for you. Okay, I'm sorry, I even barged in. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to yes. follow up with a comment on uh, Adam's uh, a question, because when he was asking it, I thought of um, Paul Barclay's book, mm -hmm. um, Outcasts of Empire, and he talks about uh, the constructedness of tradition. Um, and so if you bring somebody into the classroom and they demonstrate weaving, or you take your students to like a weaving studio and they demonstrate weaving, you can't really ask them about the historical constructedness of this, of this weaving tradition. How would they know? I mean, they just learned it uh, as an apprentice. But that's something we can do as scholars, I think, to put these practices into historical contexts as best we have. And 
as best we can. And I, I think the earliest we can go in the most, for the most part, is to the Japanese era. And mm -hmm. um, it's basically the thesis of Bar Barclay's book mm -hmm. that a lot of what we take as our, our knowledge of indigenous peoples in Taiwan was research done by Japanese ethnologists in, uh, from about 1900 to uh, the 1930s. And uh, so this is kind of scary that these people, how well did these people know the cultures that they were researching? I mean, they were outsiders, they were etic in anthropological terminology. So I'm just wondering if, following up on, on Adam's uh, uh, comments, whether you try to, to bring a, a historical perspective on the, the uh, cultural practices that you're researching um, and the, the, the education uh, of them, passing them down. Uh, when, when they're passed down, they're going to presumably change. Um, one of the cliches, I think, of indigenous people is that they don't have a sense of time. There's this essential tradition that never changes. But um, anyone in, the acad in, in academia today kind of questions this as a basic reflex, that there is no such thing as, as a cultural essence, and it's all changing from generation to generation. So I wonder if you, if you bring such a perspective to bear in your own research. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I can uh, give you one example. I interview a in, uh, 90 years old, uh, uh, old gentleman and her, uh, his wife uh, talking about a historical event. And uh, he gave me the answers totally different from what I saw from the literature, mm -hmm. either writing by Japanese or by Han people. Yeah. And uh, most of the village people know that answer, but uh, <laughs> but they don't write into books. In, even the army's teacher write a, a paper about that history, she was something wrong because she used literature yeah. review, but it's not really it, the, uh, the, not the reality. So that's why I think we need to uh, know the historic event from the indigenous point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually it's not a record. That's why I think it's very important. So I, I try, I think my research haven't been done, so I'm writing a new project right now, so I'm very busy. <laughs> so we have to do more, like uh, we have to do more uh, field work and we have to work with the I think at least 90 or 80 years old people over there, so I can find out something that's really different what we saw right now. Yeah, that always give me uh, a surprise, because, uh, but right now I cannot write it down because I only interview two people, so I need more evidence <laughs> before I say I find a different discovery. <laughs> I can overthrow all, uh, all the record right now, but I cannot write down, I need to do more uh, research. So I think for a long time, even indigenous people, they get educated, they learn from the formal education, so they don't from the dominant point of view, so they don't really learn from their own way. So when I start to uh, supervise my uh, indigenous students to write their thesis, I say, please write use your culture uh, as the first author, just don't say their culture or your culture. <laughs> because my st but in the beginning, I really feel frustrated because when they come back, they bring everything just from the literature review, like Han people write down, because they don't have their own subjective way of thinking. But right now it's different. You know, right now my, my student, like Sifu, she, he is a PhD student right now. He knows very well about uh, Ami's uh, culture, and he can explain Chinese very well, and he uh, also organized Ami's tribal school in, uh, in Hualien. So I think they are different. They, they, they already know what uh, the, the modern knowledge, and they but also they know the, their own culture very well. So they are, for us, they are creating uh, our culture. So that's why I think the indigenous culture is not only the place we transmit uh, traditional culture, also it's a place they create and they recreate their own culture on campus because they are together. So they learn from each other. Usually they are in their tribe, they are only in, like Amis people only have Amis culture. But right now, our classroom, we have people from different tribes, and they learn from each other. They form their own uh, student uh, association. So 
Um, they have create uh, their creation. Uh, I think sometimes it should be amazing because also they learn from us. We give them a lot of professional uh, way to teach or use. Uh, they can apply for it. And also, we are integrated uh, different disciplines, so they have not only anthropological view. They can have a social and a social sociologist. They can have the point from history. So they are smarter than we are because we are limited by one discipline. But my students, I think they are very creative. And once they get the confidence and they get encouragement, I, we say we give them wu tai, we give them praise, they can perform, perform very well. Because when they are doing the formal process, uh, like elementary school, formal uh, middle school, they always don't get very good academic uh, uh, results, so they lose their confidence. Well, one of my students told me when he discussed his culture in my class, it's his learning high point <laughs> experience because he never experienced he's so important in the classroom. I, we provide that chance. So I think the result is more than I think, the good result. So of course I'm too uh, positive thinking way. Some people criticize we should look at the back, <laughs> look at the dark side or something. Like that. But I'm still, <laughs> I still feel very, uh, very happy about the future. I, I saw the change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very yeah. encouraging. Do you want to follow? Yeah, I just had a brief follow up. I had a, my, my best one of my best friends, uh, uh, language exchange, um, uh, a language exchange. I wanted to learn uh, Sa'idiq, um, and he can speak it. And uh, he said when he was a kid in junior high school, he was in the Feng Yo Ban, <laughs> where it's a class where you don't really learn anything. The, mm -hmm. the teacher just has given up on you. Yeah, they're yeah. they're non academic. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's no, they'll become cops or, or, or whatever. No offense if anyone here is a police officer. And my friend actually became a cop um, because, it, I mean, his teachers had given up on him. And then he, he spent the next uh, 20 years proving them wrong. And he, he ended up getting a PhD in indigenous literature yeah. In, yeah. in indigenous languages yeah. at uh, Furin Dashi. Yeah. So I think um, there is a point to be made for just encouraging people yeah. I'm good at <laughs> as it. much as possible. <laughs> I'm Thank good you. at that. <laughs> My Thank student you. told me. <laughs> Thank you. The next question. Thank you, this gentleman up here. Okay. Thank you. So it's a, many of the questions have already been answered, but I think even from my own experience and most of the the comments that you were telling us, the stories you were telling us about indigenous communities in Taiwan, I have experienced myself with indigenous communities that I have worked with in Mexico, with the Zapotec community. But I think when it comes to this type of debates that we have in here in this space, I think they're incredibly important to be critical. It is very important to bring up this critical element into a debate, especially when you're in an educational system and you're trying to train new educators mm -hmm. for the future. That there has to be this debate because if you don't have it in the classroom, where else are you going to have it? And, but at the same time, going back to my own personal experience, and I had a particular ritual that I uh, took part of in, with the Zapotec community in Mexico, in the mountains of Mexico, and they were performing a particular ritual, a dance ritual, utilizing particular instruments for a funeral. And my question was, why this particular song? Why does it repeat? And when did it start? When, when, what were the changes? And, and they were not able to answer the question. And they had a debate between themselves. The chief of the village came over. I asked the question again. And they spent about, probably about half an hour debating and within themselves in their own language, which I couldn't quite follow. Until eventually, they just turned around and said, we don't know. We really honestly don't know. I know that I learned it from my father. My father learned it from his father. We just do it. Mm -hmm. And we know we're doing it right because it, it just follows, it, it performs the task that it's meant to perform. So I think that, of course, those questions are incredibly important, but there is a place and a time to make those questions. And I think had I pushed the question any further, it would have been the wrong time or the wrong place mm -hmm. to push something that at that moment was not necessary. Coming back to the classroom, we can push those questions. Mm -hmm. But there on the field, you will be telling them that 
what they've heard over and over and over for generations, that mm -hmm. they have no meaning, and being indigenous has no value, and their tools and their performances and visuals have no values, to once again say to them, it's really wonderful you're indigenous, but have you asked yourself what it really means? And how, how, is it, how do you become an indigenous person? What does it mean to be indigenous in today's society? And that's a huge, important question, I think, for the Taiwanese indigenous community. You've got 16 nations, 700 subcultures. I mean, what does it mean to be each one of those? And what does it mean to be in a modern Taiwanese society, face with China right above you? And what does it mean? You know? And I think that question is not an easy one to, to, to answer. Thank you. Um, so is there a comment, not a question? Um, yeah, there's a comment. Thank you. <laughs> so. Any questions? Yes, please, at the back. Thank you. So if I catch correctly, when you spoke with one of the elders about uh, who, who said that she know, knew nothing about her own culture, did you guys speak in Japanese? Yeah, so I just wonder like, what's their uh, attitude towards uh, Japanese versus the Guoyu versus the, their own indigenous language. Thank you. Thank you. And it's very interesting because in the beginning I knocked the door and I asked to for interview and uh, uh, their sons opened the door and asked me, do you speak Amish? I said, no, uh, we don't understand Chinese. No. Close the door. <laughs> then I asked the head uh, to introduce me so then and tell them I know Japanese. So when I uh, interview them, and they asked me, are you Japanese? No, I'm not. But, but uh, uh, they can talk, so we talk to each other. And, and, the fine, and this is also a very important experience for me because uh, I, my Japanese is not so good as they are. So when I have to write down something, I'm not very confident. I ask them, is it the right way to write them? So they say, oh, yeah, I want they correct for me. And I just remember a long time ago, we mentioned about those people we think they are illiterate. Because we use Chinese way, we think they don't know the word, but they know Japanese very well. <laughs> yeah. So I really uh, refrain thinking during my class to teach my students about this. Oh, but I find another interesting thing is uh, when they talk to me, I think they use different way when uh, interview people. I use Chinese to interview them because. Uh, um, Mm, they treat me differently, even I'm the same person. If I speak in Chinese or Mandarin, or I speak in Japanese, I got different uh, result. Yeah, different the way they treat me. Yeah. yeah You're yeah, welcome um, back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the, the last thing you just said is very true. Uh, when you speak to somebody in different their own language, language. Um, it's very, very different from speaking in a language that, that is not their own. Um, and I, I've certainly found that. But I, a question I want to ask is just following on from, from the last question. Um, <clears throat> is it just the older indigenous people who can speak Japanese, or have they transferred that knowledge to their, that skill to their children? Two different mm. things, languages or skills. The skill of speaking ja the Japanese language okay. to their children. Yeah, I think the children, like 60 years old or 70 years old, they, they <laughs> right now they are about that age. And uh, they can listen, they can understand, and can, they, can learning, they can learn Japanese easier than average people, but uh, they cannot speak fluently or they cannot write down. We have uh, 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 like a leg between them. So uh, for the Japanese scholar, they notice the, 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 the differences. So they say, oh, they cannot uh, get benefit because uh, right now the young people, they don't speak uh, Japanese. So they have learned Chinese. So I think most of the young uh, Japanese scholar, they can speak Mandarin very well or compared to their professors. Yeah, I do notice that <laughs> because they need to learn. Just make use of the last question, I think I, I have the uh, pleasure of doing this. Can I ask a final question? Because you use quite a lot of indigenous uh, um, education. So could you define what 
indigenous cult, uh, education means? Does it mean education for indigenous peoples or indigenous, uh, sorry, education about indigenous knowledge, cultures, and their people? Because they are actually very different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think 25 years ago I wrote a book, I mentioned that I gave the definition, that your last one. And even uh, last month I uh, went to the MOE for the uh, conference, uh, for the uh, meetings, I experienced the same thing, I asked them. Do you think indigenous education is only for indigenous people or is for all the people, all the uh, citizens? And I got the answers for all the citizens. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, on that note, can we put our hands together and thank Professor Wu again?